Chapter 12, Phony Membership. Clyde Mead was here? Bess asked Mrs. Carrier in surprise. You mean the one who is interested in Indian children? Mrs. Carrier smiled. He's the one. Said he knows you. A very attractive man. We had a lovely talk. Nancy and George looked at each other but made no comment. Bess asked, Did he tell you about the Indian children he's trying to help? Indeed he did. Mr. Mead said you had been kind enough to assist one of them. Bess's face lighted up. I even had a letter from the little boy. His name is Tom Sleepy Deer Smith. She took the letter from her handbag and gave it to Mrs. Carrier. As the woman read it, a pleased expression came over her face. If I needed any proof that Mr. Mead's story was on the level, this is it. Bess asked if she too had agreed to help an Indian child. Yes, I did, Mrs. Carrier replied. A darling little girl. Mr. Mead said she will write to me after she receives my donation. Once more, Nancy and George looked at each other. They were still suspicious about Mr. Mead's project. However, if Mrs. Carrier did receive a letter, perhaps it would prove that their doubts were unfounded. Nancy finally spoke up. Mrs. Carrier, did you make a check out to Mr. Mead to be forwarded to the Indians? Why, yes. Don't you think that was all right? Bess answered, Of course it was. You know, Mrs. Carrier, Nancy and George didn't like Mr. Mead from the moment they met him, and I'm afraid they don't quite trust him. Bess wore a smug expression mixed with a smile. George remarked, Frankly, we didn't. I certainly hope, Mrs. Carrier, that your money will get to the Indian child and not go into Mr. Mead's pocket. What do you mean? the woman cried out in alarm. George gave a candid answer. The letters from the Indian children could be fakes. Oh my goodness, Mrs. Carrier exclaimed. I never thought of that. I see what you mean. This Mr. Meade could have a partner in Arizona who sends these letters whenever he's requested to. Exactly, George replied. Nancy turned the conversation to Raleigh's house. I can hardly wait to investigate that wall with the serpent picture. But girls, please don't go there by yourselves, Mrs. Carrier requested. I finally found a man who is willing to guard the place. He'll patrol the grounds. But this won't make it any safer indoors. I don't want you falling through any more trap doors or getting locked in towers or having that robot attack you again. Nancy was disappointed. She must figure out a way to get into the house without disregarding Mrs. Carrier's request. The doorbell rang and Mrs. Carrier went to answer it. She returned shortly, followed by her brother Thomas and a couple. She introduced them to the girls as Mr. and Mrs. Jacques. You may speak freely in front of these young ladies, Mrs. Carrier went on. They are trying to help us find my brother Raleigh. Mrs. Jacques stared at the girls. She had a hard, unpleasant face. Her flashy clothes and hairdo were not in good taste. I was never so humiliated in all my life, she said. We were actually turned away from the Mountain Ridge Country Club after my husband had paid a lot of money to get in. I don't understand, Mrs. Carrier said. Mr. Jacques, a thin, sharp-eyed man with a small mustache and a tiny goatee, took up the story. Your brother Raleigh offered to get us membership in the club. Knowing your family's fine reputation in the neighborhood, my wife and I had no idea the whole thing would turn out to be a fraud. A fraud? Mrs. Carrier cried out. That's what I said, a fraud, Mr. Jacques told her. His face was becoming red with anger. Your brother Raleigh swindled us out of a good bit of money and I am determined to get it back. Thomas interrupted. Suppose you tell my sister and the girls exactly what happened. Mr. Jacques said, We knew there was a long waiting list, but your brother approached us, saying he could get us membership right away. He wouldn't explain how he was going to do it, but we assumed, of course, it was family influence. His wife, looking disdainfully at everyone, added, Raleigh Bannister gave us an application to fill out. He told us it would be necessary to pay an initiation fee in advance and also a good-sized bonus in order to put our names ahead of everyone else's. Nancy spoke up. Were you ever given a membership card? Oh, yes, Mrs. Jacques replied. 
Then one evening, when there was going to be a dance at the club, we got dressed up and went there. The man at the door did not recognize us and asked to see our membership card. My husband showed it to him. Then what happened? George asked eagerly. Mr. Jacques said he and his wife had been asked to sit down in the hallway. The president of the club came out. When he saw our membership card, he told us it was a fake. Of course, I became angry. So he pulled his own card from a pocket. It was totally different from the one I held. Mrs. Jacques burst out. It was positively insulting the way we were treated. We had to stay in the hall until the chairman of the membership committee came out. He had never heard of us, and our names had never been brought up at any meetings. We were politely but firmly asked to leave. Mrs. Carrier was blushing in embarrassment. She was speechless as Mr. Jacques went on to tell that he had threatened to sue the club. And I'm not sure I won't still do that very thing, he added. At first, Nancy had felt sorry for the couple, but now her sympathy vanished. These people had tried to push their way into the club and had even paid a bonus for the privilege. She said quietly, Mr. Jacques, are you sure you have a case? The country club didn't swindle you. But Raleigh Bannister is a club member, the man retorted. He stood up. Come on, Millie, he said to his wife. I thought these people would have enough family pride to pay us their brother's debt, but I can see they don't. Mrs. Carrier said, Raleigh will be home soon, I'm sure. We'll see that he contacts you. Both Mr. and Mrs. Jacques laughed sarcastically, and the man said, You'll never see that crooked brother of yours again. I'm sure he's skipped out for good. With that, the irate man stomped from the living room, followed by his wife. The couple hurried out the front door and drove away. Tears came into Mrs. Carrier's eyes, and Thomas looked very sober. Nancy tried to cheer them up by saying, The Jacques didn't give us any proof that they had paid out a nickel. Please don't worry. In the meantime, let me call my father. He can advise us. Please do that, Mrs. Carrier said. Mr. Drew was delighted to hear from Nancy, since he had news for her too. But first, tell me why you called. When he heard about the Jacques being swindled out of membership in the country club, he said that Mrs. Carrier and her brother Thomas had nothing to worry about. The Jacques could sue neither them nor the country club. They had been the victims of a con man, and if they ever got their money back, they would be lucky. Mrs. Carrier and Thomas feel pretty bad about Raleigh's actions. And now, tell me your news. The lawyer said he too had been trying to trace Raleigh Bannister. I finally had some luck. I learned that he recently purchased a high-powered cruiser in Miami. That's great news, Nancy exclaimed. Where is he now? Mr. Drew said that unfortunately nobody knew. Raleigh took off for parts unknown, but every port along the Atlantic coast, including those in the Caribbean islands, has been alerted. If he shows up, which he'll have to do to buy fuel, he'll be arrested. That's a terrific lead, said Nancy. She told her father about having seen pictures of the center hall of Raleigh's house before the new wall had been put up. The lawyer was amazed. Dad, she said, I strongly suspect something of value is hidden behind that wall. Mrs. Carrier doesn't want us girls to be in the house alone. Do you think you could possibly come up here for a little while and do some investigating with us? Certainly, her father replied. He chuckled. Will tomorrow morning be soon enough? Oh, Dad, you're the greatest. Okay, I'll drive up to the motel and have breakfast with you girls. Nancy went back to the living room and reported what her father had said. Mrs. Carrier and Thomas were amazed to hear about Raleigh. They were glad to learn that Mr. Drew was coming to Mountainville the next day. I'd like to go out to Raleigh's house with you, Mrs. Carrier said eagerly. We'll pick you up at 10 o'clock, Nancy promised. How about you, Thomas? Would you like to come? Sorry, but I have a business appointment. Mrs. Carrier invited the girls to stay for dinner. Shortly after nine o'clock, they returned to the motel. There was a letter in the girl's mailbox. As the clerk handed it to Nancy, he remarked, As you see, there's no stamp or return name or address on this. I found it lying on the counter. Nancy took the envelope and stared at it. Her name had been typed on.
The girls hurried to their room. When they were inside, Nancy tore open the envelope. The contents had also been typed and were brief. The note said, Hunt for the skeleton's bracelet. End of chapter 12